colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you for spending uh, time with us tonight. And I want to also thank uh, Cooper Surgical for giving me this opportunity to talk about embryo transfer, which is one of the most crucial part in IVF ICSI therapy. In our patients, it's not as simple as it looks, and it's easier than done. This is my disclosure. Nobel Prize in the year 2020 went to three physicists because of the award regarding the black hole in the universe. Well, I'm kind of sure that you agree with me that the black hole in the reproductive medicine is the implantation factor. There has been many publications, many questions were answered, but I think you also agree that with each new answer, a new questions arise in this case. What should uh, we also always keep in our mind is the difference between our job and the natural conception. Well, normally we have the sperms which goes along the whole way through the uterus, the tubes, and reach the oocyte, fertilize the oocytes, and the fertilized oocytes goes the whole way back and reach as a blastocyte on day five, the endometrium, and uh, will implant or will not implant. In our situation, the difference is that the whole process of fertilization is outside the body. We bring the day five or day three uh, embryo into the common uterine, and then the question is also again if this blastocyst or uh, day three embryo is able to implant or not. And we also agree that uh, towards uh, embryo transfer hasn't been that much attention uh, been paid. And this is also the reason I think that in uh, July 2018, uh, Fertility Study published uh, uh, 40 years of IVF and regarding the embryo transfer, uh, alone the title is suggesting everything, the often overlooked embryo transfer. But we know that is important, and we know there are relevant aspects, there are lab aspects, there are gynecological and reproductive medicine aspects. I will not go over the lab aspects because my colleague will talk about it later. I have like 11 points which I want to share with you, which has been considered as very important uh, looking at the literature in the last 20, 21 years. The first one, and according to the literature of the last decades, one of the most important one is that as operators, we should perform the embryo transfer atraumatically. What, what does it exactly mean? That means embryo transfer shouldn't be difficult. Again, what does it mean? Uh, Thomas et al. published this paper many years ago, and they differentiate between three different types of embryo transfer. The easy one, it takes place smoothly. There's no use of any other instrumentation needed. Catheter is clean of blood, and there's no need to change the catheter. The next category is the intermediate embryo transfer. The catheter meets some resistance. As the operator, you feel it. There is some problem there, but you can overcome it. Sometimes you have to use cervical forceps. You have to use the altar sheet of the catheter first. But afterwards, you uh, perform your measures, and then you have a smooth uh, embryo transfer, and there is no blood contamination. The last one, and the most important one, is the difficult one. You have 
a greater resistance. It's time consuming. It takes one minute, two minutes. You need to change the catheter. So embryo back to the lab, change the catheter. You need uterine sounding. And after all, you have blood uh, in your catheter. It doesn't matter where you have blood. So Thomas at all uh, postulated at that time, and they were able to uh, demonstrate that there's a significant difference in clinical pregnancy rate and implantation rate if you perform uh, the embryo transfer easily or if it's the difficult one, as you can see here. One another interesting aspect was that how often does it happen that you have a difficult embryo transfer? According to the, this study, it's almost about 7.6%. And don't forget, sometimes it's your objective feeling that you have performed a really smooth embryo transfer, but it's your feeling as the operator. The feeling of the catheter, if it's blood on it, it means the embryo transfer was not that smooth. And so you see blood at the catheter always play a very important role. So the question is, how can we make it easier for us as the operator? Well, one of the most important steps in order to reach this is to use ultrasound. There are lots of publication in this regard, and it's textbook knowledge that uh, performing embryo transfer under ultrasound guidance make it easier because the operator uh, can find the way uh, much easier. But there are also other stuff that maybe uh, make our life uh, a little bit more difficult, but they are important uh, in order to reach the implantation of the embryo, like removing the mucous, cervical mucus before performing embryo transfer. Why? Well, it's time consuming. Uh, you are removing naturally lubricant mucus. You have to do sometimes cervical manipulation, which can lead to uterine contractions, but it's also evidence based that. Uh, removal of the cervical mucos uh, is very important for implantation of the embryo. So maybe we can summarize it. How can we avoid the traumatic embryo transfer? Using ultrasound, using soft catheter, no blood and no mucos, and that means no trauma. While most of the publications at the time before the millennium show the very the importance of ultrasound guidance uh, for the operators to find through the cervical canal easily and smoothly towards the cavum uteri, afterwards the publications were able to demonstrate another very important advantage, namely the position of the embryo within the endometrium after the embryo transfer. But we should be careful a little bit here because position of the embryo meant many different things if you like look at the publications. For example, it could be the position of the tip of the inner shell of the catheter, position of the tip of the outer shell of the catheter, or position of the bubbles. I am going through all these uh, aspects in the next slides. Position of the tip of the catheter, uh, where do I put my catheter? But here we should also differentiate between the outer catheter and the inner catheter. Actually, there's only one publication regarding the catheter guide uh, tip or uh, where should we put the tip of the outer shelter and uh, in this publication they were able to demonstrate that there's a difference in clinical pregnancy and implantation rate if you put the tip of the outer catheter or the catheter guide before the internal os as you can see in the picture a or 
right after the internal os as you can see it in the picture B. This was the only publication I was uh, able to find in this regard. And you know, it makes also sense. That means the catheter guide is the harder one comparing the uh, inner guide. And it makes sense that if you go with it into the endometrium, upper part of the endometrium that it can uh, makes injury to the endometrium. Just the opposite, there are a lot of publication regarding the tip of the inner catheter. So like this one, where basically they uh, differentiate between putting the tip of the inner catheter in the upper part of endometrium or in the lower part of endometrium. Interestingly, in this study, they were not able to find a significant difference in implantation rate and in pregnancy rate. But if you look at the results a little bit uh, deeper, you will find the following. According to this study, the higher transfer was still at a distance of 13 millimeter from the fundal endometrial surface. And the lower transfer was at a distance of 17 millimeter from the fundal endometrial surface. So basically the same thing which you also can see in this study. That means if you put the tip of the catheter somewhere between 10 millimeter to 20 millimeter away from the fundus, you are basically safe. So if you find uh, to summarize um, all the data regarding the tip of the catheter, then we have uh, the guideline of the practice committee of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine saying that there is a fair evidence based on six studies that embryo transfer catheter placement affects implantation and pregnancy date. There's fair evidence based on seven studies that placement of the catheter tip in the upper or middle area of the uterine cavity greater than one centimeter from the fundus for embryo expulsion optimizes pregnancy rate and basically that's it. There's insufficient evidence for more specific recommendation regarding the positioning of the catheter at the time of embryo transfer. The later publication uh, were mostly in regard of the position of the air bubble. What are they? Well, basically, we have to know more about the uh, tree drop technique. Uh, the tree drop technique in which the drop of medium containing the embryo is separated from a preceding and a following drop of medium by an air bubble. This is then what you see uh, in the ultrasound as the double bubble sign or transfer flash. One of the first publication was in the year 2000 and they were able to demonstrate that 80% of the embryos uh, implant in areas in to which they initially are transferred and approximately 20% implant in other areas. A little bit later, Lumbers et al. were able to demonstrate that the position of these transferred air bubbles are important. In their work, they differentiate between this distance A, which is the length of the endometrium plate, distance B, which is the distance between fundal myometrium endometrial interface and the tip of inner catheter, distance C, which is the distance between 
fundal myometrium endometrial interface and the air bubbles. And finally, distance T is the distance between the tip of the catheter and the transfer air bubbles. CA ratio being the relative position of the air bubbles in the endometrium plate. They are able to show that the smaller the CA ratio and the smaller the distance C is, is the uh, basically the higher the pregnancy rate. But can the final position of the air bubble be predicted? The answer is no. Is it the function of the syringe, resistance of the plunger, pressure to press the plunger, or velocity? And most importantly, what we should not forget is the uterine contractions. And these uterine contractions, they can lead to the migration of the bubbles. The next group of publications, they try to find out more about the migration of the bubbles and basically the influence of the uterine peristaltic. So curious at all, were able to demonstrate that the bubbles migrate and move. What they did was that they performed a 3D ultrasound within 60 minutes after the embryo transfer. And they were able to differentiate between three groups. The static group, where the bubbles didn't move, didn't migrate, they had the highest implantation rate and the highest pregnancy rate. The fundal migration group, they had also high pregnancy and high implantation rate, but the worst one, and also the statistical difference, the group of the bubbles which migrated towards the cervical canal. And this is also the reason uh, we should avoid uterine contractions because like, using, for example, tentaculum, which can lead to uh, secretion of oxytocin or the old touchdown method, which, should, uh, which could lead to secretion of prostaglandin, with both of them resulting in the contractions of the uterus. The next important study uh, is in regard of the speed of inserting the embryos. The authors of this study were able to demonstrate that the higher the speed of inserting is, the more damaged the embryos will get. But what about the speed of withdrawing the catheter? Does it also important, this was the study of Martinez at all, that they remove the catheter just after performing the embryo transfer or they in the next group they waited like 30 seconds and then removed it in both groups as a matter of fact there was no difference at all what about the retention of the embryo in the catheter which we always check after the embryo transfer and if you are performing a double transfer you have one embryo transfer at the other one uh, still in the catheter well basically this is exactly the same there is no difference in the pregnancy rate the very early publications uh, uh, also uh, try to find the better position of the patient but there was also no difference at all in this regard one uh, very important uh, publication from Salom at all, which was able to demonstrate that the bigger the angle between the cervix and the body of the uterus, the higher the pregnancy rate, which could also be a reason why we have the bladder always full before performing the embryo transfer. Less, uh, question 
for the easy embryo transfer but the question that we've all been asked still from our patients is the bed rest after embryo transfer better or not so clearly this publication from uh, the year 2019 was able to show that as a matter of fact there is no difference and it's actually also better for the patients to get up and empty their bladder. And other questions uh, where we always confronted with is the intercourse after embryo transfer. In this study from the year 2000, which comparing one Austrian center and Spanish center, they were able to show, uh, as a matter of fact, better result in favor of intercourse. And Last but not least is the question of the experience of provider. According to this publication in the year 2006, where they compared provider E with provider B, they found out that there are differences. Difference in the presence of the blood, difference in the presence of the mucose difference, in uh, performing difficult or moderate or easy transfer and basically uh, there's a significant difference between the clinical pregnancy rate if the embryo transfer was performed by provider A or by provider B. In this publication in human reproduction in the year 2020 showed basically the same thing with the difference that uh, they could demonstrate that the numbers did not really improve uh, the skills of the operator with which I want to uh, close the circle and go back. Why is that? Is it because of the often overlooked embryo transfer? If we perform the embryo transfer for like 15 years, 16 years, the same way, well, basically, at least for five years, we are doing something wrong. So my conclusion would be, I like abbreviation, and regarding embryo transfer, I want to use the abbreviation GAS, which is gentle, atraumatic, and speed. This is the way the embryo transfer should be. And also, window of implantation, we should be in mind that it's not only temporal, but is also special. Thank you very much for your attention. And these are my references. Thank you, uh, Professor Nori, for that uh, interesting and uh, informative uh, lecture. Uh, we now move to our second speaker, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Jason Swain. Uh, Jason is the Corporate Laboratory Director of the CCRM IVF Laboratory Network, uh, overseeing a growing network of 11 clinical IVF laboratories in North America. Uh, he's responsible for laboratory design, uh, protocol and procedure implementation, as well as staff training and ongoing quality control monitoring for the network of embryology labs, andrology, and endocrinology laboratories. Uh, Dr. Swain has published numerous peer-reviewed articles, uh, edited and authored several book chapters, and contributed to various other publications within the field of assisted reproduction. His primary research interests include pursuit of methods to improve in vitro embryology culture conditions uh, through reduction of environmental stresses by modification of both the physical and chemical culture environment. Uh, so now it's over to you, Jason, uh, for your talk. I would like to thank Cooper Surgical for the opportunity to speak today on evidence-based best practice in embryo transfer, a laboratory perspective. Thank you all for attending. I would like to declare that a fee was paid by Cooper Surgical for this lecture. 
I have nothing else to declare other than perhaps a slight U.S. bias in some of my viewpoints. Embryo transfer is obviously a very important step in the IVF process. Fortunately, there are several very good reviews on the topic. Uh, some of those can be seen here. I'd like to highlight this particular publication from ASRM on a standard embryo transfer protocol template, which outlines 12 steps uh, from the committee opinion of ASRM. Many of these reviews highlight clinical aspects of the embryo transfer process. And for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to try to focus on the laboratory perspective. This is one of the first publications I could find really focused on laboratory aspects of embryo transfer. This is from 1984 in Fertility and Sterility from Patrick Quinn and colleagues. And you can see from the quote at the bottom of the slide, mention of things like adequate gassing of the medium, double rinsing of pipettes and catheters, use of a heaps buffered medium to stabilize pH, control of excessive temperature and environmental stressors around the embryo, use of a specialized media, in this case, 50% patient serum. And a combination of these uh, events led to more consistent pregnancy rates. So we'll touch on several of these points as well as others. When trying to determine best practice, one approach that can be used is a survey. You can see such a study here from the Journal of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics from 2014, a worldwide web-based survey of embryo catheter loading approaches. You can see there was a high level of agreement on various approaches, such as washing the catheter prior to loading embryos, observing the catheter under the microscope, uh, how the catheter is loaded. But importantly, over here, you can see that there was uh, quite a bit of variation in other approaches in terms of the preference for how the catheter is marked, what medium is used, how to load that catheter with medium and air, the volume of the catheter, and other factors. And I think this is, is really important, as we'll discuss. So it should be apparent that there are a lot of preferences and a lot of variations in the embryo transfer uh, coming from the lab perspective. We really do need to balance the lab versus the clinic, as this process involves both. So I think what we're going to try to do is look at what is actually known in the process of embryo transfer, meaning is there data or what has been shown to actually work and improve outcomes. As best practice, prior to embryo transfer, there must be a clear written plan for the laboratory. This plan should be confirmed with the clinic as well as with the patient prior to embryo transfer. This plan should consider the move towards elective single embryo transfer and follow various guidelines and recommendations, as seen here uh, as an example, the guidance and the limits of numbers of embryos to transfer from ASRM in the United States. Additionally, prior to embryo transfer, proper identification is required. This includes double identification of the embryo. Fortunately, there are now electronic witnessing systems that can help with this. But this also requires a patient identification, and this can be done during a timeout where the aforementioned transfer plan can be confirmed with the ID and the plan confirmation taking place with the clinic as well as the patient. And there are some workflow considerations uh, as to how, where, and when these identifications occur, uh, taking into account things like timing and the environmental conditions during the process to ensure that the embryos are not being stressed. And finally, before embryo transfer, the laboratory needs to ensure they are using the proper supplies. Selection of supplies uh, can consider things like cost and effectiveness, but also toxicity. Therefore, things like gloves, catheters, syringes, and other contact material need to be properly tested using an appropriate bioassay, whether that be a human sperm survival assay, as indicated in this publication, or a mouse embryo assay, as indicated here. This can be often be done by the manufacturer or supplier or done by the lab itself. As mentioned, the contact materials used by the laboratory for embryo transfer are extremely important. These include things like gloves. Gloves should be powder-free and latex-free. Whether they should be sterile or non-sterile is an area of debate. In terms of toxicity testing, uh, the lab really should not be touching the catheter tip or the media. One could argue that best practice would be to use sterile gloves. 
and indeed in a survey by SRM, uh, the majority of people, 89%, did use sterile gloves. These were likely cl clinicians, but the same is likely warranted for the laboratory. The syringe selected and used by the lab is also very important for the success of embryo transfer. These need to be non-toxic. This brings up the question of whether a disposable or a reusable syringe should be used, uh, whether they should be plastic or glass. Uh, most of us are familiar with the black rubber syringes, the TB syringes where that black rubber stopper can potentially be toxic versus the newer no rubber stopper syringes. Size or volume is another consideration. Most of us have access to a 1cc syringe, although now there are smaller syringes available down to the quarter cc level. Importantly, the selection of the syringe not uh, needs to not only consider toxicity, but also good control. This allows you to control the speed of the embryo transfer during injection, which we'll discuss, as well as having very good control of the embryo transfer catheter and how it's loaded with no drift of the plunger. Uh, and this could be loading dependent, meaning how you've loaded the catheter with air versus liquid. Catheter selection is an extremely important choice for embryo transfer. There are various options available, soft versus stiff. We'll hear about many of these in the clinical aspect of the lecture. Most use a soft catheter. There are different sizes and lengths, uh, those that are echogenic. There's a cost consideration as well as a package, packaging and convenience consideration. Most of the time, the physician has a preference. From a lab perspective, I would argue that consistency within the practice is very important. If you've got multiple physicians, having multiple catheters in use does pose some potential for uh, toxicity issues as well as mix-ups, trying to keep track of which physician is doing the transfer and which catheter they prefer. Regardless of which catheter is selected, this should involve some sort of lab quality control testing with a bioassay as previously mentioned. In addition to catheter selection, there's also the issue of catheter loading. One of the first questions is whether the catheter should be rinsed prior to use. This would be to remove potential toxicity. From that previously mentioned survey on embryo transfer, catheter loading techniques, you can see that most labs do pre-rinse the catheter prior to use. There is no data suge to suggest that there is a benefit or a detriment of this approach, however. The volume of media used when loading the catheter is also an area of discussion. There was a study from 2018 that indicated no significant differences when using 20 or 40 microliters of media loaded into a catheter as uh, uh, shown in the figure pictured. However, in 2001, uh, Thomas Ebner and colleagues showed that if you used too little media, in this case less than 10 microliters, that outcomes could be impaired. And uh, similarly, too much media can result in lower outcomes due to possible embryo expulsion during the transfer. Marcus Montag uh, presented a study in 2002 that indicated that around 40 to 50 microliters of media in the embryo transfer catheter was superior to 15 or 20 microliters. So as a result, somewhere around 30 to 40 microliters seems to be the optimal volume for embryo transfer. In addition to the volume used when loading a catheter, how the catheter is loaded is another important consideration, specifically the presence or absence of air bubbles. You can see a variety of loading techniques pictured here. Some like to have air bubbles flanking the embryo from a protective standpoint. Some like to see the visualization of the flash on ultrasound. There are some physical considerations in terms of loading. Uh, depending on the type of syringe, there may be more or less drift with a media backfill versus an air backfill. And some like to have an air bubble at the tip of the catheter to avoid possible capillary action and wicking and uh, potential loss of the embryo. The impact on the presence or absence of air bubbles during catheter loading and embryo transfer has been studied. Two particular studies looked at this. No significant differences were noted between the two approaches. The type of medium used when loading the embryo transfer catheter is another important consideration for the procedure. Whether this be culture media, 
whether it includes a pH buffer like heaps or mops, whether it's a specialized transfer media, perhaps with a higher protein content, as we heard from the 1984 study by Patrick Quinn using 50% patient serum. Importantly, it does not appear that adding additional protein increased the, increases the viscosity of the culture media, and in one study per, performed in 2016, there was no significant impact comparing 10 versus 20 versus 50% protein. Other approaches look at using embryo factor enriched media, adding HCG or hyaluronin, and we'll discuss hyaluronin uh, and embryo transfer media in the next slide, as well as other additives. And so certainly this is an area that has lots of room for improvement in research, I think. There's a nice study from 1989 by Menezo and, and colleagues looking at the impact of the viscosity of the embryo transfer media and whether this could potentially improve outcomes. And using collagen to increase the viscosity, they showed no significant impact. So it does not look like simply increasing the viscosity of the medium used will improve outcome. In terms of hyaluronic or hyaluronic acid, there's an updated Cochrane uh, systematic review and it appears that including hyaluronin in, in the embryo transfer media does improve outcomes. Now, the reason for this is not entirely clear. Uh, if you go back and look at one of the original publications by Bill Schoolcraft and David Gardner from 2002, they say that a plausible mechanism for the beneficial effect uh, of an increased hyaluronic concentration in the transfer media may be in its ability to mix with uterine fluid due to a similar consistency. But as we discussed in the Menezo paper, it doesn't seem that this is as simple as just the increased viscosity. Perhaps there's a ligand receptor relationship going on here. If so, there could be a volume dependency, and that 30 to 40 microliters uh, could be important if we are to see a benefit. Another question that comes up in terms of embryo transfer from a lab perspective is whether the laboratory should or should not be using mineral oil. And there's no study that uh, examines this directly. However, there is this particular publication from 2013 that compared an approach using microdrops under oil, loading the catheter from, from that particular setup compared to the use of a center well dish with no oil. There was no significant difference between the two approaches. Now certainly oil in the uterus is a non-physiologic event. Uh, we do want to minimize the risk of uterine introduction, potentially compromising outcomes. Oil is not required if you have the proper environmental conditions to ensure stability and avoid stress. And so if you do choose to use oil, most would say that it's prudent to try to rinse or remove it from the outside of the catheter if possible. Another important consideration for the lab is the timing of the embryo transfer. This particular study showed that transfers that took greater than 120 seconds resulted in decreased clinical pregnancy and implantation rates. Now, this could be to a difficult or traumatic transfer, but it also could be due to potential environmental stress on the embryo as they are exposed for a prolonged period of time to lower temperature or increased pH and environmental stress. Similarly, this publication from 2010 in RBM Online showed that as the amount of time increased for embryo transfer, there was a subsequent decrease in clinical pregnancy rate. Like many topics in our field, there is conflicting data. These two particular studies indicated that there was no impact of a prolonged embryo transfer time on outcome. Now, one important consideration uh, to look at are the conditions used in these particular studies. One could theorize that perhaps in these particular studies, they used very good environmental conditions that ensured stability and reduced that environmental stress on the embryo, and perhaps that's why they did not see an impact of time. With regard to transfer timing, it is likely prudent for the lab to try to minimize the amount of time between loading the catheter and the transfer procedure. This can help reduce the potential risk for environmental stressors that could damage the embryo. These stressors include things like temperature. Some labs may choose to pre-warm their syringe and catheter. There's no data to suggest that this improves outcomes. Some may be concerned that this could actually be detrimental due to off-gassing. Again, there is no data to support that. Really, the lab should try to also minimize the distance moved when handling the catheter prior to embryo transfer to avoid walking long distances where temperature could uh, be impacted as well as pH. And so making sure that you have warmed work environments and proximity of your workstation to the embryo transfer procedure are important considerations.
Another consideration for the lab for embryo transfer is the catheter handoff. There's a variety of approaches that can be used, and the lab needs to consider the impact on timing and those potential environmental stressors that we mentioned earlier. The lab training should ensure that all embryologists are familiar with these various approaches. It should also include what to do if there's a difficult transfer and the catheter is handed back to the lab. Should it be reloaded? And if so, should the catheter be reused or should a new catheter be used? There's no data to indicate that any one approach is superior to another. Syringe expulsion is another consideration for the lab for the embryo transfer procedure. The question arises, who should depress the plunger on the syringe? Should this be the embryologist? or the physician, and there's no clear answer to that question. However, whoever does perform the procedure should be aware of variables that can be impactful, things like the velocity or the speed of depressing that plunger during embryo transfer. Doing the transfer too fast can damage the embryos, inducing apoptosis due to shear stress, as indicated in this publication from 2012 in Fertility and Sterility, and injecting the embryos too fast may also impact their placement in the uterus. Whoever is doing the procedure must make sure to maintain a constant pressure on the syringe plunger uh, while withdrawing the catheter to prevent backflow, especially on syringes that have that black rubber stopper. There are other additional uh, things that, that could be considered in terms of the timing of removing the catheter as well as any specific maneuvers. There's no clear data to show a benefit or detriment to any of these. Best practice indicates that following the embryo transfer, there should be a catheter check performed. The catheter is handed back to the embryologist where they can then check for retained embryos. If there are embryos discovered, the physician is notified, the laboratory can then reload and retransfer. The question arises, should the lab reuse the catheter or give, grab a new catheter? ASRM did a survey on this in one of their publications in 2017, and approximately 67% of those surveyed used a new catheter. There's no data indicating that one approach is superior to another. So in summary, there are some things that the lab can do to help improve embryo transfer outcomes. There are several best practices although there is little data to support the benefit of certain things like wearing a mask, sterile gloves, the type of syringe, pre-warming some of your supplies. Different approaches may lend themselves to better environmental stability, which in theory should be better for the embryo, uh, but ultimately the impact on outcomes is, is unknown. Things like temperature excursions or pH excursions and the amount of time taken between catheter loading and the transfer process. The catheter loading approach may vary, but volume appears to be important, 30 to 40 microliters based on published data. High in the transfer media appears to be beneficial, although the exact reason is currently unknown, and the speed of the injection as well as the withdrawal may impact embryo placement and outcome success. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, both of you for those uh, excellent and insightful uh, lectures. Uh, we're now going to open up the, uh, the question and answer session. Um, and we've had um, a large number of questions submitted. Of course, we won't be, um, we won't be able to answer all of them, but we'll try to answer the, uh, the most commonly asked questions. Um, and I'm going to uh, address the, um, the first question to, to you, Kazim, if I might. Um, there's a question, some gynecologists perform the transfer uh, without ultrasound, uh, but check the position afterwards with a vaginal ultrasound probe. Are there any downsides to doing so? Uh, first of all, I think it's uh, the state of the art, according to the literature, that we should use uh, ultrasound guidance because of the benefits I address in my lecture. Uh, so, first of all, I think we should use it, transabdominal ultrasound or vaginal ultrasound during and before embryo transfer. Now, I want to ask my colleague, what is the benefit of doing the vaginal sonography afterwards, after what it happened, it's just in order to see the location? Maybe it's from benefit for doing some research, but from the clinical point of view, it's done. What's done is done. You cannot change it anymore. 
Sure. Uh, well, thank you uh, for, for that. Um, Jason, I'm going to uh, address the second question to you, if I may, and it's a, it's a question that crops up uh, on, on many occasions, uh, and that is about uh, the loading volume of the, of the catheter. Uh, in your talk, you quite nicely presented the information that's available to us, um, and the conclusion was that somewhere between 30 and 40 microliters seems to be optimal. How would you validate that in your lab? And how would you go on to uh, train your embryologist to load that volume without accurately measuring it to reduce the time that's needed, et cetera? Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, practically to validate the volume, uh, we would load the catheter uh, to our, our uh, preferred method, which we would assume would be around 30 to 40 microliters, uh, and then expel it as we would for a number of transfer, and then use a a calibrated pipette to draw up the media to, to verify whether we were at that 30 to 40. And, and it's not uncommon to find out that you might not be. And so that would then elicit uh, a likely uh, reload, uh, modification of the loading to get to that 30 to 40 microliter. Um, and then that would entail adjustment of the, of the uh, procedure, the protocol, likely a, a picture. Um, in the past, we actually had taken a Sharpie or marker and drawn on the uh, syringes to show the size of the columns, uh, taking a, a copy of that, use that as a training tool, uh, and then make sure lab staff are all trained on any modification to make sure that it did align with the volumes that, that we wanted it to align with. Yeah, that, that's that's really useful, and I'm, I'm sure people will, um, will take that away and, and try to uh, implement it in their laboratories. So we've got another um, question for you, uh, Kazema, uh, a gynecological question. Um, what happens if we discover uh, fluid in the endometrial cavity when we're coming to do the embryo transfer? Thank you very much. It's, I think it's a very, very important question. And the answer uh, would be different if you would ask the same question like 10 years ago. I would say uh, suck it the fluid and perform the embryo transfer. Today, my personal opinion is freeze the embryo. Because first of all, we have to find out what's the reason. Is it just hydrometer? Or is it the reason? Is there something pathological behind it? Again, 10 years ago, we didn't have the possibilities of vitrification as we have today. So today, I would say if there is any suspicious thing in the metromion fluid or polyp or something like that, it's better because embryos, blastocytes are important. They are precious. So it's better to freeze and to check the patient. Excellent advice. Um, I'm going to address the, the next one to both of you because I think it's relevant uh, to both. And we had a question, uh, should the lab be present in the embryo transfer room? And how should the doctor and embryologist communicate during the embryo transfer? Uh, and is there room for feedback during and after the embryo transfer? So it'll be interesting to see it from a clinical and an embryological point of view, because of course, in different settings, there are different interactions between embryologists. So what might be an ideal scenario? Kazem, if I can start with you. Actually, I wanted to hear the opinion of Jason first, but okay, I go. <laughs> okay, so I'm happy to pass it over to Jason to give his opinion first, and then you can respond. Happy. Yeah, I would say uh, I I don't think it's mandatory for the embryologist to be in the room, but I think it's helpful uh, to minimize that distance, that space, to allow for the the rapidness uh, of loading the catheter with a quick one or two steps to hand that catheter to the physician. Uh, our personal approach is that we don't have the embryologists uh, to press the plunger. The embryologist is simply doing the handoff of the catheter to the physician in the trained method according to whichever transfer approach the, the physician is using. So I do like uh, the embryologist in the room just from that distance and timing standpoint. And then in terms of feedback, uh, again, our, our experiences after the, the transfer, absolutely, in terms of notifying the physician of a retained embryo and reloading, um, if the, the physician is having a difficult time getting in based on their, their transfer approach, there's usually feedback saying, 
I'm having a difficult time. Can you get me a, a larger catheter ready? Can you get me a stylet or whatever additional supplies may be ready? So there is some amount of feedback, especially if there's a difficult transfer, which proximity also helps with that. So, so basically, I, I agree, yeah, yeah, I, I agree one hundred percent with Jason. In addition, I want to say it's also very important. I think Jason will agree with me. It's uh, well, I am based in Vienna, and it's liking uh, like dancing waltzer, Wiener waltzer. You know what Wiener waltzer is? That means dancing waltz. So you would be amazed how different it is to dance and change your partner. One of the things we do is every three months, we check the pregnancy rate, not only of the operator, but also the combination of the operator and the embryologist. And there are significant differences. That means you see the pair, gynecologic, uh, gynecologic uh, operator A uh, with uh, embryologist C, they have the best pregnancy rate comparing to the other one. So what we try to do every three months is to understand why some couple can dance waltz better than the other one. So I think it's very important that the embryologist is the person who hand it over and the embryologist should take it also. And more important, I think it's uh, worthwhile to evaluate the data and understand what are the differences. Well, that leads us very nicely into into the next question, which is about training and how to train uh, both an embryologist and a gynecologist to do embryo transfers and your experiences of, of best practice. So I started with Jason with a, with a stumble at the beginning. So perhaps, Kazem, if you could start this time about how you would train a new gynecologist uh, to do uh, embryo transfer. Yeah, well, I think uh, nowadays, also again, I can answer... Uh, these questions differently according to the time. Like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, as I started uh, reproductive medicine, so the trainees, they got the worst embryos to transfer uh, because the good embryos were supposed to be transferred by the best one, so by the experienced one, which was also the truth and which was also okay. And there is, as a matter of fact, uh, one poster in Asia 2019, I think, uh, in this regard, that if you have a bad embryo quality, there is no significant difference who is going to transfer that. But regarding the best quality embryos, the more experienced the operator, the better the pregnancy rate. So this is the fact. That means your training shouldn't start with the best embryos. This is a fact. But right now, again, the answer is, I think we have some models, American Society of Reproductive Medicine, they have some models that give you the opportunity to practice before you start on the patient. So nowadays, I think it would be for the clinicians, the first step, not to start with the patient, but to start with the model. And into the lab, Jason, about training uh, embryologists to do embryo transfer from your point of view. Yeah, so, uh, you know, first it starts with reviewing the, the protocol uh, and then performing the protocol in the, the confines of the lab in terms of um, setting up the, the syringe and the catheter, uh, loading according to our schematic or our protocol, verifying that volume, uh, having, you know, senior person kind of watch the time and, and the volume. And, and we work in isolates. So there's an additional kind of mechanical aspect to that training to, to make sure that the embryologist is comfortable getting the catheter in and out without uh, accidentally bumping it, touching the tip. So that can be done, uh, you know, pretty safely within the confines of the lab. And you can even use discarded materials if you wanted. Um, and so that's the first part, making sure they're comfortable. And then the first transfers, are a bit more, I guess, planned where we use isolates. So having them, I'll just wheel that down the hall and being comfortable with, with how to drive the, the isolate, so to speak, uh, having an embryologist, a senior embryologist with them, making sure that we've carefully selected the physician and the patient uh, to make sure that it's an easy transfer, not going to be a difficult transfer, make sure that the physician is aware 
that this is a, a you know a senior person who's being trained, that you know not a, a uh, somebody first day on the job, and so kind of buffering them, making sure that it's a safe space, so to speak, and setting them up for success, and then you know like most things, um, tailoring it to the individual. Um, some people need a bit more training, a bit more confidence building than others, but you know essentially going slow and steady and, and setting them up, up for success until they're completely signed off. And then, as Dr. Nuri said, tracking that data, especially early on, to make sure that their pregnancy rates are acceptably high. Yeah, and I think that's a reflection of um, of how important the uh, the embryo transfer is to the uh, the whole success of the um, of the procedure itself. Well, sadly, gentlemen, uh, we've uh, we've reached the end of the session. Um, I'm extremely grateful to you uh, for your presentations and for answering the the questions and sharing your knowledge. And also thank you to um, all of the people that have attended uh, this webinar and uh, all of the questions that have been raised. And I'm sorry that we haven't had time to, uh, to answer all of them. Um, after this webinar, you'll receive your certificate of attendance, as well as a link uh, to an evaluation survey. And we really do appreciate your feedback and encourage you to use this opportunity to let us know what you think of both this webinar and the series that we've produced uh, in that way, we can uh, tailor the content uh, to uh, future um, interest to the uh, to the wider audience out, uh, out there. As usual, the recording of this webinar will be shared with you after it's been approved by our scientific board. Uh, and thank you for your patience for that, and it will appear on our, our Knowledge Hub. Uh, meanwhile, please visit the Knowledge Hub on the website where all of the previous educational webinars are available for replay um, and uh, there's some very interesting um, topics discussed there. Uh, we hope to see you for our journal club next week on Tuesday, uh, May 26th, uh, where the paper that's been presented uh, is endometrial scratching in women with one failed IVF or ICSI cycle uh, outcomes of a randomized control trial uh, called the Scratch Trial uh, that was published in Human Reproduction in uh, 2021, earlier this year and registrations are open on the website for that. Uh, finally, we have uh, just launched uh, the second episode of our educational podcast series, uh, Cooper Insights. Uh, subscribe uh, on your favourite podcast app or listen on our website to Male Fertility, Could Reproductive Health Screening Help? Uh, so in the meantime, it's just left for me to say, uh, keep safe and stay healthy uh, and please join us for future events.